today's uh, panel panel discussion um, in collaboration with the Experimental Arts uh, uh, Organization and the University of Tasmania. My name is Kane Schnatt. I'm the Associate Director for the Cultural Collections and Galleries here at the University of Tasmania. I am uh, dialing in today from uh, the uh, unceded lands of the Mobinani peoples, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm here dialing in actually from Nipolina Hobart, which is literally the country in Tasmania. And uh, it's, it's my a great privilege and a great honor to be here this morning with some fantastic guests that we have here today. Um, we will begin the panel by hearing three presentations and then we'll have a QA and a and a little later. Um, oh, firstly, we have Suzanne Kite. Um, Suzanne is an artist and an arts researcher and, um, and a curator as well. From uh, and a multimedia artist, and she is dialing in from Tulsa, so it's very late for her at the moment, and um, and and she's very kindly uh, dialing in from Tulsa in the United States. Um, uh, Suzanne is an Ogla Oglala Lakota performance artist and a visual artist, and um, she's joined here today as well by uh, Dr. Leoli Ishragi. Uh, Lelo Ishragi is also a visual artist, um, a writer, curator, and researcher, and he's working between Australia and Canada. And I'll, I'll introduce uh, Leoli a little bit more before his presentation. And um, finally, we have Dr. Jen Evans, uh, who's a queer direct woman here living on uh, and with connections to Palawa country as well from Lutruwida as well. Um, and I'll introduce both of them a little bit more in detail shortly before their presentation. So um, we have participants from um, all over the world and we have our panelists dialing in from various areas. And I want to acknowledge all of the First Nations people um, from all of the countries from who they are participating from, but also on land that we are um, that we are as guests to practice, play, and make work as well. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and here we go. So these are my websites if you want to find me. Um, so I'll begin by saying uh, how mataki api on petu washte. Good evening, Suzanne Kaira Machi api kusto. Oglala Himacha, I'm Oglala Lakota. Shante washte anape chiusapo. My relatives, I shake your hands with a happy heart. Um, currently, Muskogee Creek Reservation uh, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, Elwati. And uh, this is where I'm joining you from. So uh, I am. Uh, an artist and a composer and a musician and um, I'll basically whatever I'll do whatever <laughs> and uh, a lot of the times my work looks like this <clears throat> uh, and I perform with a hair braid interface and um, this is a machine learning uh, a, musical tool that I have developed over the past decade. <clears throat> and, um, and I'm continuing to develop in my PhD. I'm a PhD candidate um, at Concordia University, uh, where I also work uh, as a research assistant for the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. And um, I've also been the global coordinator for the uh, project um, Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence, um, which we have a working group and uh, recently published a position paper. I'll get into that a little bit later. So I'll just explain kind of where my art artistic um, kind of world is at and, and how this came to be in the uh, sculpture that has been uh, in touring with Experimenta, my collaboration with uh, Devin Ronford. So, uh, this was a piece called Listener, um, where I was working with this hair braid interface and uh, started to think about um, questions of what is the tool I want my future self or my future generations or seven generations from now, um, a question that uh, was prompted by uh, the workshop um, given by the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, the Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace um, uh, Lab. Um, the question was, you know, what who is your what is your seventh generation uh, descendant or intellectual descendant or artistic descendant what do they look like and what do they have and my answer was um, they have um, you know part of themselves if it is 
uh, involve, uh, intertwined with artificial intelligence or technology, it is um, with it being as Lakotas, our, our hair is an extension of us, and um, and that made sense to me to have a hair braid um, interface. So, but backing up to in interfaces at all, I was a I was a violinist and, um, and a composer, and I uh, became interested in composing with the computer in relationship with the computer, and I've kind of stuck to this concept of. Of, of a circular relationship to the computer um, this whole time. So I'm thinking about, first I was really into sonification. So what, what, is, what happens when I sonify data? I take data and um, I turn it into sound. And then visualization, which we're more uh, familiar with, um, taking data and turning it into the visual. But I was interested in this idea of what happens when I take data and I enact it with my body. Um, how far, how mediated is that? How far away from the data can you really get and still be interpreting it? And how can I get these things to talk to each other inside the computer um, where the computer is making decisions and I'm making decisions uh, and those decisions are intertwined? <clears throat> and I see that as really wrapped up in uh, ideas that um, I didn't know at the time were very Lakota ideas, but now I understand that you know, when my grandfather uh, spoke about making a new song, he, he, point, he pointed to his throat. So my understanding of learning songs or making songs or composing is it's a it's a process of listening while hearing while creating while knowing while channeling all at the same time. Uh, and um, this kind of led to building these um, these early uh, interface holders. I needed something to put the interface on. Somebody to house the accelerometers, house the little electronics, and um, these were first developed with a friend. Uh, James Hurwitz, uh, and the carbon fiber little sculptures you see on the right, um, where I, I learned how uh, Devin Ronneberg, my collaborator on, on, on this, a lot of these projects, uh, is a, helps, he builds airplanes, experimental airplanes, and one of the main materials is this carbon fiber. Um, so I became interested in that and made some, uh, some sculptures with that. So this is kind of what it looks like in the computer. This is a, I, I don't use this model anymore. Um, I, I skip the, the visual part, but this is basically what it is. I'm, I'm holding the accelerometer. It knows um, the tilt, yaw, and roll. It knows that it's turning. There's James um, showing um, this very early prototype. And it, uh, I can connect this to the different DAWs that I use. So here's Ableton Live, a, a, a digital audio workstation. So let me show you the first piece I did with this. saw is this, um, well, first of all, it's a collaboration um, with musicians where they're improvising and I've arranged them um, this particular way. I like to work with musicians. And um, what you're seeing, uh, what you saw earlier, is I'm controlling sound. I'm, do I'm doing some different experiments with relationships to sound. And this piece, people, you must look at me, you know, I was trying to compositionally unfold an event in my life in, in tactile storytelling, trying to be entwined with my listening, have my body and my listening um, be as indistinguishable as possible. Play with these direct to indirect relationships. Um, and then, so a few years later, um, when I developed Listener in 2018, I really wanted to investigate um, how I could incorporate machine learning. Uh, and um, this was before I began to attempt to articulate anything about artificial intelligence, but uh, 
trying to think about ways I can entwine my listening um, with the decisions that the machine is making. So I'll play a little bit of this. So what you um, see there is um, this is what there's this I always make these kind of overly elaborate audiovisual things where there's a million moving parts and this is one of the moving parts in listener where there's this dial um, with these Lakota geometries that are growing and changing and um, the it's like a compass and I'm uh, moving my hair braid interface I'm uh, it, the hair braid is changing a synthesizer in the computer and the machine learning weaponator uh, developed by Rebecca Friedbrink um, is listening to the audio changes and making decisions on how to move this uh, compass. And then I'm watching the compass and making my decisions on how to move the hair braid. So, so I'm trying to um, lose myself in, um, to, to the very kind of minute changes in, in decision making. <clears throat> So I guess I'll come now to uh, this um, this piece. So this piece um, has kind of two versions right now, two iterations. Um, one is called Eon uh, EA or Telling Rock, and the other one is Little Picture. And uh, these are hair braids. Uh, they're not real hair. Um, I consider them to be made of song first, power sound processors, machine learning decisions, handmade circuitry, gold, silver, copper, aluminum, silicon, fiberglass. Um, and their house, this is an, uh, looking up at it into the acrylic dome. And the, these are the uh, circuits that are handmade by Devon. And uh, the hair braids are about 15 feet long and they're wrapped with leather. Um, and the, uh, it's a similar process where you're you're moving the hair you're moving the hair braid and the flex sensor or the accelerometer um, is making decisions on how to change a, a voice in that's coming from the dome, and the voice is in Lakota and and speaking a poem a song. I wanted to show this, but it's not connected. Um, I'm just going to skip forward. So in this. Uh, it was really important to me to work closely with my cousin and, and my aunts. I mean, with my whole family always, but you know, especially with my my cousin Corey, who um, I include in a lot of my pieces and, and consult with a lot and um, learn from a lot. And here we are welcoming this piece uh, when we showed it in Omaha. And this is a really important part of the artwork that is not art. This isn't art. This is this is us trying to understand if it's possible to greet this thing in a good way. Um, so I'll um, sh just show a couple slides from my research. Um, I'm really interested in trying to investigate how I can make artwork in an ethical way, uh, not just in a vaguely ethical, but in a uh, very clearly um, defined ways of Lakota ethics, how I, how I can do that. And I've been really thinking about that um, and trying to develop this, this thinking in terms of listening, how, how listening in particular uh, can create ethics. So for example, listening to the land um, leads to ways uh, um, knowing who is a being, knowing what is a being ontologically, which can lead to knowing how we know and then um, ethics, and then all this the methodologies, values, cosmologies, song can, can emerge from that. So I'll just give you the quick example that I really like in thinking about where the Lakota received um, songs and the, the way songs can heal. We received this from the prairie chicken um, in the Black Hills, um, where our people are from, where we emerged from stone. And uh, when 
I'll give you a, a quick in the really quick <laughs> version of this very important uh, story. But we are, um, I'm, I'm, uh, an old man goes to the Black Hills to die. And there he lays down to die and a prairie chicken sings to him and uh, teaches him a song. And he learns a song and it begins to heal him. And the more he dances the dance and sings the song, the more he's healed. And he, by listening to this prairie chicken, he, he's able to go down to the people and show them that song um, is, is healing, song is medicine and song can do miraculous things. So uh, I, I love that it's, it's very simple, but it, it, all it took was listening to non-human beings to know that song can uh, heal and song is medicine. And then we have an ethical process of, of healing of, uh, and, and, and ethical songs that are based in listening to the non-human first and foremost. And, that, and, and so I extend this in my research to, um, uh, this is online, um, Making Kim at the Machines. Um, this is a, a co-written with Jason Lewis, Nolana Rista, Archie Bichawas, and myself. And, and I'm extending this idea of non-human um, beings to um, stones in particular, because our computers right now, our computational technology are made of stones. Melted stones, reconfigured stones, but stones nonetheless. Um, and I elaborate on this a lot more in, in this, uh, how to build anything ethically um, contribution, but I'll just kind of give you the basic outline right now. And I like how this kind of looks like the, um, the sculpture uh, as well. Uh, but so how to build anything ethically is, is just a kind of an ex um, thought experiment to try to understand if I want to make something how, and I'm thinking that protocols are the way we do things ethically, the, the way we have ethical methodologies, ethical indigenous methodologies, what kind of protocols are going to be necessary to make artificial intelligence in a good way? And uh, this is the first imagining of it. Um, I imagine that there needs to be an ethical protocol stream for data collection, for the physical computing device itself for compensating all parties involved, human and non-human, uh, for the distribution of the artificial intelligence, the use of it, the software design, the coding language, the governance. But if we zoom in on just one of these protocol streams um, that's on the right there, you know, we have ideas of consultation, um, identifying stakeholders, what kind of raw materials are we using, how are we compensating all beings involved, building a base, preparing the internal components, construction, running the program, and most importantly to me and most interesting to me, transformation, because I feel like that's what um, is really occurring when we put um, electricity through our uh, stone materials, or, uh, there a transformation occurs. And, and, the, and there's, a, there's some very clear similarities to me to um, transformations that occur in, in ceremony. And uh, you know, and then the other really important thing that is completely left out um, in current uh, computational production is the death cycle. How is this thing going to die in a good way, in an ethical way? So um, this way, this line of thinking is how I'm trying to work through artificial intelligence as a problem. And art, um, AI is just a way to think about the way ethics can be applied, but I really am an artist and um, I'm interested in, in, the, in the art making. I'll play a little bit this to end.
so. Um, I think, let's see if there's any other little things I wanted to drop in here. Oh, I'll show you my aunts, my aunties, who help me a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, here's my sweat lodge, here's my rock friend, my spirit helper. And I'll leave you with a quote from my, uh, my grandfather who said, um, spirits, uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking him about the future and if we're, if we are supposed to know the future. And he said, um, you know, knowing the future is very dangerous. Um, but spirits um, and ancestors are just there on the other side and they're trying to help. And uh, it is our responsibility to listen to them. So thank you. Suzanne, thanks so much for that. Um, lots of lots of interesting projects, interesting work, and, and um, I really would love to come back to some of them and, and really unpick some of those as well and hear a little bit more from you um, with some of those projects. And, and we'll get to do that in conversation with the rest of the group. So again, thank you for that um, presentation. And, and now we move we move on now we move on to the second presentation for today and that is from Dr. Uh, Leoli Ishragi. Um, Dr. Leoli Ishragi is of Samoan, Persian and Cantonese heritage. He's a visual artist, a writer, a curator and researcher and works between Australia and Canada. Um, uh, Leoli intervenes in the display territories to center indigenous kin constellations between cent central and spoken languages and ceremonial political practices. Um, and he is dialing in right now from uh, Little Way to Tasmania as well. Uh, Leoli, over to you. Ilenei tula a vea yolo o leo e faima fufonga tamo limoli le faala potopotonga a tangata maui o mandua manipulona, nipaluna. E faatalo faatu ma faafelo a iatu le paia malame malo le aso. Tato malo fao alo 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 nia ai maisi le paia malame malo o le nei taiao. If I know at Natama or your Aranda Mamuinina, Malolo Soifua, Malolo Soifua Manuia. To Muinina country, whose occupied territory of Nipaluna and surrounds I speak from today, and to the Aranda nation, whose occupied territory of Mbandwa, I bring you recent artworks. I recognize your indelible relationships, knowledges, and governance of land and water, and bring my ancestors' teachings of good conduct and peace to this gathering. I come from the villages of Apia, Leulumwenga, Siumu, and Salalulonga in the Samoan archipelago, Najar Fabad village on the Pars Plateau, <clears throat> and I also recognize my Cantonese, Marshallese, German, and English ancestors as well. This image is a portrait taken by photographer Stuart Miller at the Aparpa Clay Pans, a seasonal wetland south of Mbandwa or Georgia, sacred Aranda nation lands occupied by the settler town of Alice Springs. I've lived for a year in this territory and arrived as a visitor only this week to Muinina country. I'm an artist, curator, writer, and early career academic researcher working between Canada and Australia. I'm passionate about genuine multilingualism, increasing literacy in the indigenous epistemologies and ontologies of the majority world beyond so-called Renaissance Europe and championing indigenous sovereign visualities and inter intersectional futurities for and by indigenous peoples of the great ocean which you might know as the Pacific Ocean and Rim, but that is not a term that has much validity. Histories held in languages spoken and visual pulsate between layers of bamboo cotton, river reed, floral bark, and synthetic fibers. Come lines gesture to stellar arrays through sweaty dances, shimmering crystals and salt, plants and fruits, hold collective Malamalama, Malama, and back through nine heavens and three earths to Pulotu, genealogical epics whispered by screen light, speculative possible worlds massaged by Tamanu, long sought bearings in lands subsumed, still sacred.
Handmaking renders systemic alibis, lightweight, against breadth of knowing. Cooking continents, aromas tenderly guarded, to ancestor and kin presences. We are not artifacts and objects, which are lies in Middle-earth containment. We are not feathers and leather, reparations in indigenous world balance. We wear rivers of song and verse, an anchor for who is to come. Tilting heads, really seeing each other, and you floating through the mist. This hearth to change all prior land grabs and declamations. This documentation of Awauli, my Australian Centre for Contemporary Art Open Commission, launched online in October 2020, was produced by Ekahi Vahi, Drew Kahu Aina Broderick and Sanchia Nash for the Hawaii Contemporary Art Summit earlier this year. Awauli affirms my intention to connect, to locate, connect with, and honor the Mersina, or ha treasured handcrafted belongings, and Iloa, genealogical and ceremonial political knowledges that are imbued in playful and rare works of Lama, Candlenut Ink, and Ua, paper mulberry bark. Siapo Mamanu, or barcloth, marked with designs by hand, and Siapo Tasina, barcloth marked by pressing relief motifs, continue to be made by Samoans and many other indigenous peoples of the Great Ocean. Nonetheless, our cultural genealogies remain disrupted and imbalanced by the absences and estrangement experienced with the vast majority of our Measina being held cold and sterile in European and North American public museums, archives, libraries, and private collections. Perhaps in 2025, uh, when I situate this artwork, Awauli, my deep, deeply divided, colonized, and traumatized people and archipelago will sound, look, and feel softer and kinder. The dizzying thousands upon thousands of Siapo Mamanu and Siapo Tasina, made by ancestors with their bodies in these Western epistemic and political institutions of sanctioned culture, haunt us, their descendants, as tangible archives of their making between the 1700s and 1960s. In other words, from before Western temporality, morality, centralized governance, plantations, capitalism, and Christian shame. From before multiple clan-based polities based on responsible, deliberative decision-making and close kinship with lands, waters, and skies, and the entire beyond human world. What I propose as Siapo Ma, uh, sorry, what I propose as Siapo Viliata animated barcloth, as videos linked by poetic verses, you see here as an elegy to the ingenuity and creativity of the ancestors of all Samoan peoples. Like me, the majority grow up dislocated indigenous peoples of the diaspora, sometimes at home in the voyage, sometimes torn between conflicting epistemic and political frameworks. We are, despite us, enmeshed in the settler colonial and militarist industrial complexes that dispossessed kin that dispossess kin first peoples in Australia, New Zealand, United States, and Canada. We are not living in large communities in close proximity to the Mersina of our ancestors in most of the places where they are kept. Awauli then is an offering to the ancestors and to the young who realize the futures of wellness and balance we so desperately need and hopefully deserve. Awauli is both a genealogy, carefully infallibly assembled by myself, of our histories of visuality, and, embody, and an embodied visual marking of the va, or relational space, that my body moves through with other living beings as it visits Mbandwa in occupied Arunda Apmara and returns form to collectively shared Samoan motifs and patterns thousands of years young. The second component of this project Talafa Asolopito of Aalinga Atta, Samoan Histories of Visuality, is an archive. Just like the attention and gasps in a village ceremonial gathering are held by the deftly woven iatonga, or fine pandanus mat, iafau, hibiscus woven cloth, and lengths of beautif beautifully marked siapo ma manu or siapo tasina, these research layers educate, inspire, and validate the knowledge of our ancestors and the drive of our young today. It is at once Alisif Apapalangi, Western epistemic list and Atta Fetu, stellar imagery, These, which is composed of complex essays, photographs, poems, performances, adornments, installations, moving image works, reviews, and suusuenga, sustained research, which together are much more than a required reading list for an undergraduate outsider looking in course, maybe titled Introduction to Samoan Visual Cultures 101.
though none such courses exist for the thousands of indigenous nations of the great ocean and its shores. I hope that this in some way redresses the absence of Samoan centers for contemporary art and decolonial practice. In As We Have Always Done, Anishinaabe, writer, poet, and visionary, Leanne Betasa Mosake Simpson writes, resurgent organizing must create a future generation that never has to ask how to live free because they've never known anything else. A generation that does not know shame because they are embedded in each other's light. Drawing on her, in, her ideas of indigenous futurity, of unashamed brilliance, this necessarily reconstructed archive is designed for connection with multiple senses. Sit a while, leave and return, coffee or cup of tea in hand. Hold in your heart and mind these currents of thought and creative practices realized in recent decades by this constellation of my kin. Uh, and note that all entries are organized by contributor last name and then and also by the sorry by the missionary imposed Samoan alphabet with other letters following this order. Be Courageous Language Teachers Reading Room is a multi-year expanding syllabus, reading room, and limited edition screen print collection created by Richard Fletcher, aka Minus Plato, from Ohio State University, Eliza Smith from Columbus Printed, Printed Arts Center, and myself as guest librarian in late 2020, and continuing through to April 2022. Extending on Minus Plato's The Empty Days Library Project 2019 to 20, Potufaita Tusi gathers important books on international indigenous visual arts and philosophies at the Columbus Printed Arts Center as a kind of constellatory syllabus of multiple sites and citations. This project alternates between being led every few months by different international indigenous artist or writer whose practice delves deeply into sensual spoken and marked languages, tattoo, the built environment, painting, literature, etc. Each will share which books are significant for their art histories and design a limited edition uh, screen print centered on an indigenous language phrase, proverb, or concept whose resonances through oratory and ceremonial political life are generative. Artists who who, sorry, artists who have contributed text, language term based limited edition prints and knowledge include Sebastian Calfuque Aliste, Mapuche, Sarah Biscardilli, Yaktitutituaktitlhini, K. Rusu Katupiri and Vera Poti Reseca, Guarani and Nandewa from central Brazil, Indigo Tu Wuchun Gonzalez, who's Southern Ute Af and Afro Indigenous, and myself. Here's another closer look at some of the texts in the reading room. And uh, this is uh, my limited edition screen print. Uh, it adds a faux archival gaze to memory of my ancestral lands on Upolu Island in the Samoan archipelago, where my parents have recently been planting taro, fruit trees, and processing wild cinnamon. The text is the only pre-colonial prayer that I currently know taught to my siblings and I as, a, as children, sorry, by our mother, Sone Shragi of the Sao Samonatafa and Sao Faseetautua clans, who is CEO of the only mental health rehabilitation center in the islands. Um, moving into uh, curatorial roles and spaces, curated by John G. Hampton, executive director of Mackenzie Art Gallery, Musée d'Art Mackenzie, and myself, Wong, La Rivière qui passe entre les rochers, The River that Passes Through the Rocks, is an international exhibition which opened in June and which concludes next month, uh, September, end of September. It is uh, the final outcome of my Horizon postdoctoral fellowship with the Initiative for Indigenous Futures at Concordia University, where Suzanne is uh, currently undertaking her PhD, and a continuation of dialogues between John and myself for a number of years on the iterations of visual, gestural, and uh, verbal or signed languages take with intersecting colonialisms, deeply impacting them. Pasabukijina Wong includes new and existing work by artists Joy T. Arcand, Pat uh, Patrick Cruz, Nico Hindin, Kath Kathy Mattis, Caroline Monet, Faye Mullen, Rashad Newsom, Kite and Devin Ronneberg, uh, Carl Trahan, and Gutingaru Nyupingu. Pasabukijina Wong presents artists from across Turtle Island and the Great Ocean who examine how languages survive, adapt, exceed, or resist frameworks of colonial violence and repression. 
considering languages and cultures as living systems in the manner of rivers and other bodies of water. This exhibition looks closely at what happens when the customary flow of a language is interrupted, diverted, or impeded by an outside force. Our languages adapt, slow to a trickle, leave dry paths carved in the land that are waiting for new rainfalls, or flow ever strong through new or neighboring channels, and the perseverance of these waters continues to feed and sustain the peoples and cultures that rely on them. The artists in Pasakijinawong present represent this continuing life force, articulating renewed architectures of language and thought, fed by new and ancestral ways of knowing and viewing the world. Employing sound, silence, image, body, fiber, and tactility, they each map the multiple currents that flow past the seemingly monolithic domains of colonial languages to expand our imagination and understanding of unfurling histories and futures of culture and communication on this planet. I'm really pleased, uh, and I'm going to end uh, with uh, some another project uh, over uh, in, Tur in Northern Turtle Island. I'm really pleased to be taking part in Momenta Biena de Limage uh, this September, October in Mo Montreal, Montreal, known in Ganyengehaga, sorry, Ganyengeha as uh, Jojage and in Anishinaabemowin as Muniang. My largest installation to date, Reconnaissance, was commissioned by the Biennale of Sydney for its 22nd ed edition, Nirin, under artistic director, Radri and Celtic artist, Brooke and Garu Andrew. It opened in March 2020, two weeks before the global shutdown. So I'm truly grateful that the screen printed fabric lengths, neon text and ring works, metal infrastructure and performance video work can be presented in a solar presentation at artist run center Diagonal in my other home city under the title, The End is Where We Start From. Uh, La fin débute toujours autre chose. I have been working closely with curators Stephanie Hessler of Constal Trondheim, Camille, Camille Georgeson Usher, sorry, Georgeson Usher, Usher <clears throat> of the Indigenous Curator Collective, Collective des Commissaires Autochtones of Canada, Himali Singh Soin, and Maud Johnson to realize this solo exhibition, which I sadly would not be able to experience in person myself. This will be my largest exhibition in Turtle Island, and the autumn fall uh, will coincide with a, another group exhibition uh, for Career City Cinema and Performatorium in Regina, Saskatchewan. It's truly humbling to continue to exhibit at a distance and perform online despite the restrictions of the pandemic. Gregorian Shame Time, installed in the Great Ocean by Euro Mission, Euro American missionaries, planters, colonial administrators, entrepreneurs, and slave mongers keeps Fafafine, Fatane, and other indigenous gendered peoples of the Great Ocean in particular in a backward whiteward trajectory to annihilation through recurring intersecting forms of violence and the promotion of death as the only exit from pain and unbelonging that extinguishes hope. In my ancestral villages on Savai'i and Upulu Islands, as in the diasporic towns and cities I have lived and worked in, spanning Australia, Canada, Vanuatu, and France, the imaginary of possibilities is limited, but only now by the white supremacist intellectual, aesthetic, and spiritual spaces of sexual coloniality and cross-reality. Thank you for attention and presence today. That was fantastic. Again, lots of questions, lots of connections, and a lot of thoughts uh, which we'll pick up at the, um, at the end of this uh, panel as well during our Q&A. Thanks again. Um, we'll now move on to our third presenter, uh, for for today, and that's uh, Dr. Dr. Jennifer Evans. Um, Jennifer is a social and cultural geographer whose research and advocacy blends technology with country and with queerness, uh, all to create safe spaces for Indigenous methodological uh, methodological research. Um, Dr. Evans is a queer Darug woman, and uh, she's living on and with connections to Palawa country, Lutrawita, uh, Tasmania. And uh, she's also a, an indigenous, indigenous research fellow here at the Rural Clinical School at the University of Tasmania. Uh, Jen, over to you. Okay, ya kalinga. Welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Jen Evans. I'm a proud queer Darug woman. My mob is from Sydney, Australia, and I've been lucky enough to be born and conceived on Palawa country, where I have wonderful kinship relationships with the, all the beautiful Palawa and Pakana people here. Before I start my presentation this morning, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the old people, the ancestors of Luchawira 
and all her islands. I'd like to acknowledge the strength of the Palawan and Pakna peoples of Lucharita, their tenacity and their never-ending will to keep their culture alive and vibrant. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the First Nations people here today, and I pay my respect to you too, to your ancestors and to your elders. Today I want to have a yarn with you about my upcoming book that I've co-edited with Dr Emily, who is a Trulaway woman from Tibu Kuna country in Tasmania. Emma is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research fellow with the Swinburne University of Technology and is based here in Luchawitta. Our book is titled Indigenous Women's Voices, 20 Years On from Linda Tuhai Smith's Decolonising Methodologies. And how our book came into being was a direct response, response to the seminal decolonising work of Maori scholar and leader, Professor Linda Tuhai Smith in her 1999 book titled Decolonising Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples. Now, for those who don't know much about Linda's work, I have to say it is the most amazing piece of work on decolonising methodologies and has had a huge impact globally. I just checked this morning and the citations of this book now have exceeded 22,000 um, and that's up by a couple of thousand for when I looked last time. And she's been fundamental in influencing many critical Indigenous scholars on critical race theory, Indigenous standpoint theory, and many, many more. So for us, she's been a total anchor, a major point of inspiration for us. So for those who um, may not be aware of her work, I might just read a section of her book that really situates us beautifully and can describe how we've been able to spring from the platform of her earlier work. This is Linda's words. The development of theories by Indigenous scholars which attempt to explain our existence in contemporary society has only just begun. Not all these theories claim to be derived from some pure sense of what it means to be Indigenous, nor do they claim to be theories which have been developed in a vacuum separated from any association with civil and human rights movements other rationalist struggles or other theoretical approaches. What is claimed, however, is that new ways of theorising by Indigenous scholars are grounded in a real sense of and sensitivity towards what it means to be an Indigenous person. So 20 years later, we get together and we curate a book of our own, um, purely of Indigenous women's voices. And from here, we take our inspiration, license and freedom to shape our own vision for decolonising methodologies and theories that Professor Linda has provided for us. Through the creation of our book, we've provided safe spaces for us to explore what it means for us to develop our own decolonising methodologies, springing forth from our own black female bodies. We are responding to Professor Linda's call using kinship across continents. Now, I'd just like to read you some words from the introduction of our book, which describes who we are. We've carefully curated our book, drawing together 13 international black female voices from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and Finland, plus two distinguished professors and elders before we close this volume. These women authors are the torch bearers and the next generation researchers and practitioners to implement and improve the ways in which we de decolonize the world around us through leveraging indigenous knowledges from a position of strength, solidarity and self-determination. This beautiful piece of art here is, has been made my, by my gorgeous sister, Billy Lyme. And Billy Lyme is a Melbourne-based queer artist and this piece of work of hers, In Flame, was chosen for the cover of our book because it speaks deeply to us about the inner flame of female strength, the flame of, of our personal power. And we totally love this strong woman represented in Billy's work. She embodies our indigeneity and the diversity of our black female voices. 
And when you look at her, her gaze is unwavering, brave and grounded. She symbolises our women's business, our decolonising women's business that this book has made possible. Just so that you can get an idea of who we are and the, how we can situate ourselves in this decolonising work and what we mean by women's business, I'll just read a section from our book which I think explains beautifully what we mean when we use the term decolonising women's business. Indigenous women across the globe are precious and rare. We comprise about one and a half percent of the world's population, yet the mark we leave is far greater than our numbers. We have nurtured, stewarded, loved and care for our planet across thousands of generations in every place that our community has been found. We are integral to the world's health as the air we breathe. We're the grandmothers, the mothers, the daughters, the sisters, aunties and nieces that sing and grow into the being of the lands, skies and seas, biodiversity and giving environments that sustain families, communities, societies and life through our deep knowledges and our worldviews, all gained from caring for everything. We work, live, love with our men as whole families and communities like any other, yet atypical to the Western nuclear family ideals. Rather, we respect the rights and the autonomies of women and men and prize our own knowledge domains as they are entwined, not separate. Therefore, we are strong in using the term women's business to delineate our powers, to make decisions that affect our cultural, spiritual, economic, territorial and family lives. Women's business to us is a celebration of the many forms of our female identities, including what we know also as queer women's business, which gives us the cultural authority to exercise such powers. Now, this beautiful plant is a special plant in Luchawita. It's commonly known by the Palo Pacan people as the blueberry. And this, um, this plant, the, the leaves of this plant are used in basket weaving in Luchawita. And so I use this image now to narrate our decolonizing frame in which we supported our authors, who, who we have referred to and engaged with through our uh, writing of the book as our sisters. Many of our um, contributing sisters are early career researchers. We create a safe space for them, nurturing, encouraging, guiding them in their scholarly work, allowing them plenty of time for them to discover their decolonizing methodologies. We gave them time to grow and expand their black female voices and craft their decolonizing work. And this is quite unusual in terms of the normal Western academic norms where there's tight deadlines and pressure to perform. We chose not to do that. We wanted this book of sisterhood, of women's business to evolve comfortably and safely. And then we gathered around our virtual fire, the collective strength of their work ignited. And their work is absolutely incredible. These beautiful women, our sisters, have provided new and critical insights about country and connections, violence and safety, wisdom and knowledge, decolonizing minds and seeing ourselves. And for many contributing to this book, it has accelerated their academic careers and transformed their scholarly work. This is our women's business. This is our decolonizing work, free from the constraints of Western academic norms. Now, this beautiful basket was made in Lichurita by a late Aboriginal woman friend of mine many years ago. And this basket holds beautiful kinship for me. It's very special. 
and it inspired the chapter that I wrote in our book entitled Can Men Weave Baskets in Queer Country? A friend of mine is a proud gay Aboriginal man and he dreams of making baskets in cultural safety. So I wrote my chapter as a means of providing a safe and anonymous voice for him by posing the question through employing decolonising methodologies. In Luchawida, the tradition of basket making is being revived after disruption caused by colonisation. I'll just read you a section from my chapter, which helps you um, understand how I'm actually framing this question about can men weave baskets in queer country. There is a new wave of colonisation in Luchawida country where arts and curatorial movements are co-opting Palawa culture to buttress their prestige and privileged status. Tensions exist between sharing traditional gendered women's cultural revival and the legitimacy of non-gendered sharing and learning of basket making practices. So my approach to writing the chapter moves and I bring in the voice in the agency of country and the role that country has in gendered cultural practices. Country has its own agency, its own power, commanding ontological relations with place temporalities. I want to talk about now the methodology that I use, the decolonizing methodology in the chapter that I wrote. And what I have here is a hunting club uh, from Luchawida. And this was gifted to me by a Palawa elder with whom I hold a very close kinship relationship. So when employing my decolonizing methodology, I use this club. And I use this club by casting it into country while asking country if men can weave baskets. And as I did this, I applied critical and political theory to country whilst reflecting on the cultural safety of gay Padua men who may decide developing their own basket making practices. So my question in casting this club is filled with tension between decolonizing aspirations for some to restore traditional roles and rights and responsibilities and others who wish to decolonize their queer native body and recover their specific tribal gender and sexuality. And this is how I cast clubs in the country. This slide here is, a, is an image of the vast and beautiful Takina country, which is an absolutely magical and amazing part of Luchawita country, like all of Luchawita and her islands. And this Takina country is located on the western side of Luchawita. Over the horizon here, you can see, well, you can't see, but there is the sea country. And above is the expansive sky country. And as I deploy my decolonizing methodology, I take my club and I assign a Western theory to it and I cast it into country. Each time I cast the club, I look to country for answers on the appropriateness or otherwise of the Western theory. I use my club to test queer theory I use this queer ecology. I use my club to test ecofeminism. And then finally, I use my club to test nature conservation. And each time I cast the club, I critically analyse what benefits the Western theories give to us as Indigenous peoples, our relationships, our aspirations and relations with country. And all the time, I'm seeking insights on gendered cultural practice and space for queerness, space for queering, and space for being queer. I conclude that not much of these Western theories work and that the answers lie in Palawa eldership, supporting those that seek queer relations with country. I also conclude that I find, it, what I find is precursory to establishing the exploitatory boundaries for men to develop their basket making practices. In my chapter, I set the conditions for the proposition 
using critical scholarship to frame its potential theoretical thresholds. Now, this is, this is a beautiful piece of river reed, which has been woven into string by a close pal of a friend of mine. I wore this string on my wrist for many months while I was writing and curating our book. It gave me strength and focus. So now I close our yarn and return to our sisters who've written this book. Through our decolonizing women's business that this book has facilitated, we now have special bonds like the string. Our voices are strengthened and entwined in a combined black female voice that hopefully will inspire others. Thank you. Some really, really lovely points there as well. Um, and, and a wonderful way to sort of thread between um, the first two presentations as well, um, to hear from you in this way and, and bringing it back to Lutrovita as well, which is where we're hosting from. Um, okay, now we have, we're right on time, which is fantastic. We have about 25 minutes and half an hour to have a, have a yarn with each other. Um, if I could ask all the panelists to come back online with your video and your audio, um, it'd be lovely to see all your faces again. And now is also the time for, um, um, for those dialing in and um, uh, a dedicated audience who are all still here to ask us any of the questions that they would like. And Nikki behind the scenes is going to field some of those Q and A's and I, I might raise that up here as well in, in dialogue. So fantastic. Um, before I actually begin, I must come clean and just put my disclaimer. I, um, our, our wonderful chair had to withdraw and um, I am hoping to fill in at least the, the little toe section of big, very big shoes to fill. So um, I, I'm a guest on Palawa lands and I'm speaking from an allyship frame and I'm speaking from my own sort of heritage frame, which is that of Luso Indian. And I've lived on many countries. So um, fortunately, many of the, 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 the um, many of the, uh, the attendees wouldn't have to hear from me much and they'll be really hearing from you. So uh, that's my disclaimer out of the way. So as we wait for some questions, I was actually just, I, I might just kick off and maybe ask you, you know, something that stood out for me here as well is just the importance of kinship and the importance of continuing relationships, you know, with, with machines, with land, um, with country, uh, with people, with inanim inanimate with objects, but also all other living entities as well and to each other across continents, right? Um, from a research methodology perspective, one of the challenges I know in any non-Western frame is the, um, the very kind of discrete nature of projects, i.e. a researcher might work with a community and at the end of the project, the research, pro uh, the research or the PhDs, for example, there's a disconnection from that community as well. So I suppose my question, and I would love to hear from each of you is, how have you, uh, what are the challenges that you have faced in, in your practice, be it your artistic practice or your research practice, uh, curatorial work as well, in when, when it's intersected with the academy? And how have you overcome those challenges in some way to retain those relationships, um, particularly when they are of communities for which you are also a guest from, you know, and, and like many of us are, so. Anyone, <laughs> I want to pick on someone. I might start. Um, uh, I uh, completed my PhD in curatorial practice at Monash University um, just before the establishment of the Wamajika uh, Jimbana Indigenous uh, Visual Arts and Design uh, Research Lab. Uh, and I, yeah, I think one thing that came up uh, in both of your presentations for me is thinking about accountability and transparency and like community-based ethics. Um, so I didn't, I purposely didn't go through the ethics clearance to work with communities I was already part of because um, I just felt like the process was so alienating and uh, intrusive. Um, so I would like interview elders or uh, community members for articles that were being published in art magazines. Um, or in other journals, and then I'd quote those <laughs> in the relevant in the relevant chapter from my PhD. Um, it's it's not I wouldn't I'm also now a supervisor, so I'm not sure I would allow the student I'm supervising to do that necessarily. But uh, it, I think it's like case by case, and um, that really like I was also fighting the university on like a 
you know, extremely Eurocentric reading list and um, them just kind of not really understanding uh, the relationships that predate and will postdate my research journey within within that faculty. Um, and uh, for me, it's like, it's not necessarily, like I think a lot of um, social practice education in Australia, which I've been part of uh, in terms of teaching socially engaged art practices, um, is this kind of like fly in, fly out minor uh, in working in um, racialized communities and indigenous communities, but I don't think that's sustainable. Um, and I don't think it's a relevant approach when you're working with your own community. Jenna, I might throw it to you to hear from your experience yeah, sure. as well. Yeah, yeah. sure, Kane. I think yeah. um, the fundamental principle, I mean, it might sound a little bit uh, mechanical, it's that principle of free prior, prior informed consent with community. It's mm. just so important with research. Um, and, you know, if anyone wants to learn about the fundamentals of research, I mean, Linda's work, Linda Toy's work still holds true mm. after all that period of time. And it is about relationships and engagement. So engaging with Aboriginal people and communities, um, and I'm, I'm talking from my perspective here in Luchawitta, um, it's about establishing those relationships. It's about maintaining those relationships. It's about understanding your role as a researcher, whether you're Aboriginal, Indigenous First Nations or not, and about the consequences of what it means to do research to or research with communities you have to have pretty good reasons as to why you want to engage and think deeply about the consequences of what it means to engage with research um, yeah maintaining those relationships on an ongoing basis is just so important yeah absolutely and I think um, Nikki's posted some links as well to the uh, to the the work of Linda Tuway you mentioned Jen so that's there for um, for for those dialing in to to follow up on if they're not familiar with the work already as well um, Suzanne yeah I I've I've coming from an art education you know I was educated in music uh, and I didn't start doing research until you know 2017. Well, I didn't start doing the research actually till this year, um, the research, you know, so um, I felt very woefully unprepared by arts education to even use the word ethics uh, because ethics are not taught. Um, they, I went to two of supposedly some of the best art schools in the, U in the US, Bard MFA and Cal California Institute of the Arts. Um, and it was really the still grappling with the um, the gap. I don't even know how, the vacuum of ethics in, and I don't know after um, that are in Western art. Uh, so, kind of coming from that into making art and doing research creation projects where I'm making art and doing collaborative art with my community is you know is a real. Uh, a real, I had to really, really retrain my brain and even separate out, um, this is what artwork looks like when it is um, purely critical. This is what artwork looks like when it is generative of, of new of, of concepts. Um, this is art that's for the community. This is art that is to be um, consumed by a Western audience. Uh, all that sort of trying to piece that out, parse that out. And you know, I've had an I had an experience um, uh, recently. Uh, well, well, first of all, doing my PhD research is and is an ongoing experience because I have you know the thing is like there is no flying out like this is like these are my these are my family members this is my rest of my life. I have a responsibility, um, a responsibility to people's legacies, to their words, to uh, you know it's it's forever and. Uh, so, and it's, and there's a lot of spiritual and, and you know stuff involved too and there's no hiding from that uh you know yeah. i can't i can't mess that up but i had an, I've had an experience recently where, where i'm i'm taking the you know taking uh, uh linda smith's work and and thinking about indigenous methodologies in um like an art and i won't name the art institution but you know i, I wanted to work with an elder outside of my community and i found that i i had really you know, 
um, little, I've been a little spoiled getting to work with amazing curators and people who are who have read Linda's work, who are um, who understand the responsibilities at stake. Um, but then I was working with some um, some people in the arts administrations who who don't know that um, I'm, you you don't you treat elders in a certain way and 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 I've experienced in a a form of embarrassment I've never felt before, where I was so I was so worried and I felt so responsible and so shamed um, that uh, that somebody with power and money could talk down to not even my elder, not even my community, but but I'm responsible because I created that relationship and that's my relationship to maintain because it'll come with me for the rest of my life. And it's it's just it's like it's so it's so much. It's like there's so much at stake. So yeah, those are my recent experiences. Yeah, and actually, you know, um, yeah, so, you, you know, each, each of you have kind of worked in very different contexts as well, across different contexts as well, on country and galleries and in museums. We have a question here um, um, that, that says, you know, um, well, firstly, starts with a comment. Thank you, everyone. Such great projects. Given the breadth and depth of your research and work, are museums the best site for these projects, or is there another model of your for your various practices that you can think of that may be more appropriate? Leoli, I might ask you, because you've done some work with the, the, the printed, uh, the Columbus Print Arts Center, perhaps. Could I speak uh, as, as guest librarian in that space? Curator, guest librarian. Yeah, uh, it was interesting because I met um, Richard Fletcher, who was, uh, who's an amazing academic and was a uh, scholar of European classics. Uh, and then went to Documenta, which uh, the Documenta, the most last one, the most recent one, um, that had a whole lot of uh, international Indigenous artists and thinkers really um, decentering Europe and this um, uh, particular lineage to ancient Greece and ancient Rome that forgets that all of those translations came to modern Europe through Baghdad, through Muslim intellectuals, that forgets the many layers of translations and then there are all these other texts that um that aren't uh mentioned and also that uh, i guess yeah so richard changed from being a academic of the classics we met in Sharjah. uh lisa rehana and myself were exhibiting in the Sharjah biennial in 2019 and got talking about like how do you address the like erasure and complete epistemic violence around all of the knowledge systems from the great ocean, uh, for which for me includes Australia, Aotearoa, Papua New Guinea, you know, all of the indigenous peoples and knowledge systems around the, the rim, because this is a highway, an oceanic highway of connection that only stops a few hundred years ago with the you know, scramble for Africa and the scramble for the Pacific. Um, and so we came up with this, um, a reading room and I was you know ideally I'd be able to go to spend time with community there in Columbus um, but we've been able to uh, make this project happen online and you can um, visit the website and see all of the texts that each of us have contributed uh, and for me that's like you know when people are like oh what, what's up what about a syllabus and also thinking back to the really visionary work that a lot of indigenous academics were creating uh, uh, kind of a participatory syllabus online around Standing Rock when it was first coming out, Black Lives Matter, different movements around the world, um, and finding a way that, you know, I guess it's also a way to uh, constructively address my frustrations with the um, poultry change in Australian Academy, um, where I didn't choose to go to art school when I was 18 because there were no islanders who would be versed in any of the art histories that I come from or from neighboring nations. And now that I'm 35 and finished a postdoc, there are two. So it's, you know, it's, uh, things haven't changed that much. And of course, I'm very aware of like many uh, rounds of funding cuts and things. Um, but that's some, that's one kind of, uh, you know, like this engagement and interest for me in creating our own archives and uh, creating our own reading rooms. So uh, in many projects as an artist and as a curator, um, there's a reading room component for me because I'm, you know, you really can't assume that people understand the work to the level that you would hope that they could. Yeah. Jen, did you want to say anything to those to that question there, or? I, I think um, there's great power in 
uh, community run and led museums. I know there aren't many, but I mean, we do, we do have one here in the Twitter. Yeah. They're wonderful places for our, our work to be located, um, brilliant locations. And even though I, I have been critical in, you know, um, modern mainstream um, colon, colonising museums that we do have in art galleries, there are, there are spaces um, for us there. I think need, more work needs to be done, though, in deeply questioning their colonising and, and settler invasion positions within those institutions and a deeper and greater understanding of cultural safety, cultural appropriateness, obligation. Um, so much today there's benefit in museum and galleries engaging with culture, Indigenous cultures, of course. I think more needs to be done to now give back and meet their obligation um, in terms of having the benefit of our culture. Yeah, and 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 um, each of you has spoken on, in various different ways about where you begin the where you began a research project. You know, um, yeah, I think Jen, you mentioned, you know, you you started with by uh, the, the the metaphor and 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 and, pract and literally as well the club, you know, asking country, you know, so starting with asking country as well, um, and I think um, Susan, I recall you saying, you know, uh, one of the key most important things is making sure that we're compensating all beings involved, all entities involved, you know. Um, but maybe a corollary question there is, I'd love to hear from you about your thoughts on who really owns the information. Again, one of the challenges of the Academy in terms of the research methodologies, that is, that is the Eurocentric approaches, um, about ownership of information. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you about uh, your views on, you know, who really owns the information and 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 who has the agency for that that data in in that research or uh, the, the or the the artistic work as well? Yeah, and those are th those are interesting questions, and I uh, would love to get a postdoc in Indian law, but I don't think I have time in this lifetime to do so. So that that may maybe, but. <laughs> Uh, while it would bring my mother great happiness, I don't think it'll happen. But so I, um, I'm not. So there are a lot of people who are real experts in indigenous um, data sovereignty, and there's a lot of really amazing work coming out of Australia, um, especially in terms of I, um, IP and intellectual property rights. Um, I think that um, as an artist, my expertise is it seems to be in just imagining. Um, uh, new possibilities um, in the future that that could be possible. Um, I had the um, real pleasure of doing a lot of this um, really expansive and and, and it is a long term imagining with uh, with, with some other folks like uh, um, yes Morgan uh, and um, I have an ongoing collaboration with Alicia B Wormsley and Afrofuturist and and thinking about you know really expansive possible maybe unrealistic models for um, uh, working with software and hardware uh, in, in the future and how, that can, how those softwares can, can fulfill our community needs and, and, our, and dreams. Um, so, but you know, to, on the more like practical level, um, I, I think that the, the models that we've talked, especially um, uh, uh, Jen's model, like that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I really draw, I'm drawn to and thinking about, um, it's not a question of reinventing um, new and then creating new ways of storing our data safely. It's about thinking about the ways that we already do so. Um, we already have the tools, we already have the processes. And I think, um, you know, in thinking about, you know, so this, that question, I, that's why I love transmuting my questions. Okay, so I take out AI, I put anything back in the middle. So, um, okay, how do we keep our cultural in um, uh, knowledge safe? Who's allowed to access our cultural knowledge? Um, are we willing to sacrifice um, uh, knowledge and uh, if, if it's not safe? Um, and that happened many and it happened many times and I think happens every every day, maybe not every day, but many, many times a year where an elder says it is not, this knowledge is too powerful and no one is ready to hear it. So, so it, it, it goes with me. 
And, um, and I think that lesson can be applied to, to data sovereignty as well. Um, anyway, okay, I could ramble about data sovereignty for a long time, but um, really interesting question because the material, it, it comes to the point that not only we're talking about materials, um, but um, when our data is material too, it is a manifestation of us and we are deeply in relation to it. And so, um, yeah. Um, it, what you're when you're speaking, Suzanne, it reminds me of um, Sam Monetavalu and performance artist uh, Rosanna Raymond teaching me and others on a residency about us being the latest manifestation of geneolo genealogical and speculative matter, um, and that basically, you know, it's not just that our DNA sequencing is data, but we are data, uh, and the separation of inanimate and animate in a Western epistemic system is very counter to the relational world where everything has a role and everything has agency. Uh, and I also just, um, I'm reminded of um, uh, Fanganui uh, art historian, uh, Dylan Rainforth, who um, was doing his master's at um, Monash when I was doing my PhD, uh, when he wrote, um, kind of riffing off um, uh, another art historical text on, um, Aboriginal art in Australia, where um, I think Ian McLean says Aborigines invented contemporary art. And so uh, this text was Aborigines invented, um, Aboriginal peoples invented object oriented ontology. Um, so, you know, it's like this kind of um, reversing of authorship from Europe to all of the knowledge systems of the majority world, which are thousands of years older and vibrant still. We have a very, thanks, Leoli. We have a very shy audience who are still all here listening very quietly. Um, Jen, oh, and, and Suzanne, maybe this might be one for you. I heard you speak about, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, the seven generations ahead. And uh, I, I recall, and I forget the artist's name, you know, who talked about systemic change sometimes, particularly in terms of racialized environments, takes about seven generations to undo uh, physiologically, the, you know, the trauma, but also culturally, the changes that need to occur. Um, and I heard you speak about the, the, you know, the idea of the death cycle as well. I'm curious about how that approach might be translated over to um, artistic practice, but also specifically then research practice. You know, in, um, in Jen, you were, you were sharing about your work about creating safe spaces, and um, and just now we were we're talking about when might we allow for knowledge systems to be let go, you know? And um, um, in, in the case, Suzanne, what you just shared about the elders saying it's too dangerous um, and, and this might be the end of the line. Is, is, is there any kind of thoughts that come to mind about that? Yeah, I'll just say something briefly. Um, I, I was just counting how, um, how many generations I am from the Wounded Knee Massacre because I just did um, a, I'm working on a project right now a really beautiful exhibition that's going to be open and plug in contemporary in Winnipeg with um, uh, the um, Inuk artist um, Asiniak and um, uh, Metis Solto um, artist Dame Danger. And it's a, like a trio. Anyway, I'm, I'm working on this sound piece. And I just listened again to the audio of the interview. It's going to be in it. And, and I'm, I'm the sixth generation. Um, uh, and so um, I, I, I have obviously we're in a rough. <laughs> patch humanity was um, and I think about that a lot and I think about um, the fact that I still want children a lot um, and uh, even though that seems like a logically a very bad idea but I'm sure it seemed like a bad idea at wounded knee as well um, and I and I'm wondering you know I'm wondering about that seven generation from then um, or seven generations from me anyway I, I kind of lost track of what the question was, but um, I, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very intense thing to try to imagine or allow us. And that's, that's what the initiative for Indigenous Futures, I was very like, no, future's not for me for um, when I got there. And then I really had to come around. Massive question that you're posing here. That is, um, sorry. Uh, no, I think that's a really exciting one. And I'm, so I'll probably just go around, go around it a little bit, but. What I really liked about what Suzanne um, had to say, and I really connected to this, was listening listening to create ethics, listening to the non-human. And 
I really hooked in there with talking about thinking about my work and talk, and engaging with the agency of country. Country has such strong agency, and embedded in that is all sorts of things: creation, stories, the dreaming, and depending upon where you sit philosophically in that non-human human way of knowing and being, I I believe firmly that those those powers can reach forward, back through the generations. We are not constrained by these notions of generational tensions in particular. Um, I think for me, if this is where I get excited about the creative decolonizing methodologies because this allows us to ground ourselves in safe spaces to really explore who we are without being too constrained about getting into some of those um, hedged debates and conflicts in and around gendered cultural practices and about revitalization of culture who should do what, who should say what. Of course, I always do predicate it at the end of the day, everything that we should do should be underpinned um, by eldership in some way. I think that's you know, a fundamental component because eldership is a notion as a, as a living way of being and knowing in your indigeneity is a very, very strong anchor. And that is something that does anchor us through the generations. So. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but I think, you know, I look where, where the answers aren't obvious, I look to country and to eldership and use I, those. I, yeah, go. I, I remembered the po point of what I was going to say, which was while, while, while um, people may choose to not pass on information and that we, we feel this the weight of seven generations and things coming to an end, the only thing I, I learn every time I spend time with my um, with my family is that it's my relationship with with country with the land it's my relationship with um, the spirit world where new knowledge that's what's so great about art and being native and is that we can make new knowledge and make new things every single day and um, in and that's what's that's what's so so beautiful <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks, Jen. We have a question popping in, or a comment. Um, love the idea. Love the idea of creative practices as being instrumental in decolonizing methodologies and providing a safe space for dialogue with querying, with the non-human, and with the land and with community. Sorry, that was not a question. That was a comment. A good comment coming in. <laughs> My bad. I'm reading as I'm going. Perhaps, Lily, were there any other comments from you? If not, I might I might start to wrap this up. I promised everyone we would be on time, and we're going to keep that promise. I'll just have a I'll just say a quick thing that like mm. um, the particular situation of Samoan people is mirrored across many Indigenous peoples of the Great Ocean, where a majority of us live on other other First Peoples lands, mm. and so cultural memory is splintered. Plus the you know, hugely negative and continuing impact of mission evangelization and the shaming of a brown body, the shaming of a queer body or bodies that would we would call queer um, that mm. live beyond this binary and have for thousands of years. So I guess the most important kind of thing for me is trying to s create experiences, make work with uh, kin that and that is like pictured in this future past um, mm. and still being like critical and not like, you know, as if there aren't already um, local forms of patriarchy and things to combat with. I'm not saying that the past was some like paradise, um, but uh, I, I, as somebody who grew up in Australia and has also grown up in our lands in Samoa, cannot um, leave the cultural memory of Samoan people to the university in Samoa, to the Museum of Samoa. It has to be something that is co-created by artists and curators and scholars all around the world because we have all of these tools with us that we, we have undergone different education, different training and um, been mentored by different elders in different places with different teachings. And I think for me, it's like piecing together who we were and who we can be is like a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a constellation experience and together we'll get there somewhere. We'll get to some place. But it's not a 
uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense, but basically that like I'm trying to, uh, me and many others, we're trying to future proof the culture memory of our people because our lands may subsu be subsumed by the ocean very soon, which is also a primary ancestor of ours. So it's like, how many laws have we broken for the sea to swallow us whole? And what, and what does that mean if we don't have land as the mnemonic uh, device to teach to continue the transmission of knowledge. So then how do we do this in a digital space? How do we do this in relationship with others? These are some of the questions that are important for me going forward. Such a, a beautiful poetic question. It's given me goosebumps. How many laws have we broken before, you know, the, the ocean and the sea swallow us whole? Um, we have a, qu a, a quick question that's popped in and this one is for Jen. Um, specifically, given the traditional separation of genders, do you find acceptance from the ancestors with your queer identity? Wow, that's a that's a really good question. Yes, I do. I do. I do find an acceptance from the ancestors because I am who I am and I come from who I come from and I am where I am. And it doesn't prevent me, my queerness doesn't prevent me from connecting the country, it doesn't prevent me from my kinship relationships. Um, it's so deeply part of me, I can't imagine it not being me. And I, I don't see it as a barrier. It's, it's transparent. It's, um, yeah, it's who I am and how I am. And I recognise it in others as well. And that's, that's probably important too. Wonderful. I'm sure there's a there's a, a huge conversation there to to talk about being proud and and the, you know challenging shame that Lily you were just speaking about as well. And we'll have to keep that for another day, uh, perhaps in another dialogue, in another conversation. Um, I'm going to borrow your words, Leoli, here and just say and out of context slightly, but you know perhaps the the end is where we start from. And um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here today um, and for being exceptionally generous with your experiences, your knowledge and your, your cultural practices and sharing that so, so generously with all of us. Um, I'd like uh, to thank you as well for, for having this dialogue with me as well in this space um, and with this audience. And um, just very quickly as well, just to thank the people behind the scenes, um, um, Nikki, Nikki Pastore from Experimenter, our presenting partners, uh, Experimenter, Jonathan Parsons and Nikki Pastore, my colleague, uh, Jane Barlow, who helped pull all of this together. We got here in the end, despite being the challenges of space and time. Um, so uh, again, thanks so much again, um, Dr. Jennifer Evans, we have Suzanne Kite um, and Dr. Leo Lee Ishragi as well. Thanks for being here.